Welcome to our department uh, academic breakfast. I want to thank Bani for agreeing to come. Uh, Bani had uh, graciously agreed to take three lectures for us on interstitial lung disease. Previously, we have had only like one talk, and it was a huge, expansive area. So this time, kindly has agreed to take it as uh, two, two different types of ILD every class for three classes, and we are eagerly looking forward to that. Uh, thank, I want to thank Jennifer for organizing this whole function. So thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and we can just send a message to all the PGs to come quickly and other faculty also to start. Um, after the breakfast, as usual, we'll have a meal together. So with that little bit, thank you very much, Bani, again. God bless. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for calling me for this talk. Thanks, Jennifer, for arranging. So I remember uh, meeting uh, Tambu sir on the way a couple of months back and the background was that uh, ILD is a large topic and to cover we just get an overview but not depth into each of the subtypes and for uh, even for MD exams the examiners expect more you may get short notes long questions on that. Uh, so we decided to split it into three and the first is uh, uh, today's talk is uh, concentrating on IPF. Uh, and also a new entity which is evolving in the last five years called uh, progressive fibrotic ILD, which is non-IPF. I will come to it. So, so uh, I'm going to keep it a bit interactive. Uh, so please feel free to uh, stop me to ask questions uh, because if you've not gone into depths of ILD, it can be quite uh, mind-blowing. So please, I will be as slow as possible and as clear as possible feel free to stop me uh, and I will ask questions in between as well. Yeah. So I will be going through uh, ILD nomenclature because this is evolved and is evolving uh, over years. Uh, then there are multiple guidelines that have come up. So I will be talking briefly about how those have evolved over time and what we can expect. Then what is the current accepted classification of ILD because that itself can, you know, you can get it as a short note or whatever. Uh, there is there's quite a bit of Indian data in the last four or five years, uh, which was not there uh, any time previously on uh, data from large centers, large series and uh, there's a last month publication on incidence and prevalence of ILD in India as well with some assumpt assumptive statistics. So I will bring that in as well. And then we look at the profile of IPF, the diagnosis, then the focus will be on IPF, diagnosis, prognosis, the treatment, follow-up and monitoring. Then this PF ILD or progressive fibrotic ILD is being renamed as progressive pulmonary fibrosis or PPF currently in, in this year's guidelines. And uh, then I will talk about a bit on the uh, one slide on the upcoming and ongoing research and what is expected uh, in the near future. So if you look at interstitial lung disease, it is a heterogeneous disease. It is not homogeneous. Uh, the lung involvement is heterogeneous, but it is diffuse. It is not focal, except in uh, very few situations like focal organizing pneumonia. You could either get unifocal or multifocal organizing pneumonia. Otherwise, most other uh, interstitial lung diseases are di have diffuse involvement. And actually the term ILD is a misnomer because uh, the disease does not involve only the interstitium but it involves the parenchyma as well. And the spectrum involves varying degrees of inflammation and fibrosis. Uh, it is based on whether it is a fibrosis predominant process or an inflammation predominant process, various categorization have occurred. And there are varying etiologies and a good chunk of it is still unknown etiology which comes under the basket of idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. And for this reason, the current accepted scientific terminology of ILD is DPLD. It is not ILD actually. People still keep using the word ILD because everyone is familiar with it. But the correct terminology is diffuse parenchymal lung disease. Next. 
So the name has evolved over time. I think the uh, name uh, cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis is what uh, many of us uh, who uh, did our undergraduate 20-25 uh, years back uh, would remember. This term was coined in the year 1968 and it remained so for about 30 years. It's around 98-99 that uh, terms evolved to call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and then the entire idiopathic non-IPF was also recognized and put into the basket called IIP. Uh, then there was a move towards pattern-wise recognition because by then HR, HRCT came into use in the early 90s. So people were able to recognize patterns of fibrosis, inflammation, where is it uh, uh, bibasal, uh, is there an apico-basal gradient, is it subplural or central and based on pattern of uh, HRCT uh, they were focused uh, uh, differentiation that was possible. Then there was also etiology wise recognition other than the idiopathic other etiology wise uh, classifications evolved. Next. So this is uh, from next, one more click please. Yeah, so this is from clinics of chest medicine in 2021 where they tried to summarize uh, all the uh, classifications that have come. Next slide. So I've tried to pull it into the, f the first slide has, uh, so there are two kinds of uh, uh, guidelines that have come from the year 2000. One is looking at uh, the entire spectrum, like classification, like that. And the other is all focused on IPF. This is where predominant of the guidelines have come. So this slide tells us that the first classification of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia guideline came in the year 2002. And uh, it was predominantly uh, uh, drive, uh, driven by the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society and remains to be so. The only guideline that is from the B British Thoracic Society was in the year 2008 uh, where the, along with the New Zealand and the Irish Society they came up with these guidelines and I had the privilege of being an observer in the, under Professor Athol Wells at the in Interstitial Lung Unit of Royal Brompton Hospital. And he is an ILD textbook of his own and with each patient, the way he describes the inflammation, fibrosis, just by looking at the patient, clinical and the, the entire radiological, the inflammatory picture is really amazing. So he is today still stands as a stalwart in ILD and now what has happened is he has mixed himself with the ERS and all subsequent guidelines are from ATS and ERS. Then the, uh, the 2002 guideline was modified in, in the year 2013 and that remains as the standard uh, classification currently. But there are subtle uh, information from 2002 that is important. So I have just made my own classification combining 2002 and 2013 which will be helpful if you want to understand the entire classification of ILD. Next. The first IPF uh, guideline came in the year 2000 and in this there were mi major criteria, minor criteria, uh, usual interstitial pneumonitis is a radiological correlate to IPF, also a pathological correlate to IPF. But there were very clear distinctions saying this is definite UIP. If that is there, you don't need a biopsy. Anything else is there. A surgical lung biopsy is mandatory. This is by 99-2000. And the treatment at that point in time for IPF was prednisolone and azathioprine. So I remember when I was doing my uh, DNB uh, in respiratory medicine, all my patients with IPF, I have given prednisolone and azathioprine for years. Till a very important trial came called the Panther PF trial which compared prednisolone, azathioprine and n cysteine. Second arm had uh, n cysteine alone and placebo. And the trial had to be stopped midway because there were eight deaths in the triple therapy arm as compared to one death in the placebo arm. And it was realized that the triple therapy is harmful to patients with IPF. So that stopped and along with that evolved all the trials with antifibrotics and today the treatment of IPF is antifibrotics and not actually anti-inflammatory. So the prognosis is a median survival of uh, 
three to five years, that has not changed much. Uh, five years survival is about 50%, but with ongoing antifibrotic therapy, this is likely to change because it delays the progression of IPF. Next. These are the IPF specific um, guidelines. So 2011, then 2015, 2018, and 2019. Uh, all ATS, ERS, the Japanese Respiratory Society and the Latin uh, American Thoracic Society also uh, came together to bring out these guidelines. Uh, you don't need to go into these in depth, but I have given you what is required for you to know. Next. The latest guideline is the 2022 uh, IPF uh, update. This is very important. It's got some important changes. And this is what is talking about this new terminology called progressive pulmonary fibrosis, which is typically non-IPF uh, category of diseases which may not be even IIP. They can be fibrotic NSIP, they can be hypersensitivity pneumonitis, they can be connective tissue disease associated ILD, but they have a progressive fibrotic phenotype. So this has been recognized, identified and there have been RCTs on antifibrotics in this category as well and uh, that has shown benefit. So that is why this category has come out. And then I just put the rest because there is, if you leave IPF out, the rest of the guidelines is very, very sparse. There's one on HP in 2020, there's one on idiopathic pneumonia autoimmune features in 2015, there's one on sarcoidosis in 2020, that's all. Every other focus has been on IPF, next. So this is the classification which is very important, so please make note of this. So DPLB can be classified into that which has etiology and that does not have etiology. Those which have etiology are granulomatous, which is sarcoidosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Then you have those with known association, connective tissue diseases, where rheumatoid is the one which has got uh, the ILD. If you have someone with CTD ILD, you are most often likely to uh, it's most most often likely to be rheumatoid. Having said that, the, the connective tissue disease with most prevalent ILD is, which is the connective tissue which has high prevalence of ILD. Yeah, very good. Systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis, actually autop autopsy studies show that 90 to 95% of all SSCs have interstitial lung disease. Then we have uh, SLE, uh, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, all these also could have ILD. Uh, then we have miscellaneous where we have the Langerhans cell histiocytosis and the lymphangioleomyomatosis. Uh, but what is more commonly seen is the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. And that is classified into IPF and non-IPF. Uh, and then into the current guideline classifies into major, rare and unclassified. Unclassified is when clinical radiopathologically we are not able to put it into the criteria of one of the IIPs, then it goes into unclassified. The rare ones are the lymphocyte idiopathic uh, uh, pneumonitis which is seen more often in where do you see LIP? LIP is the ILD which is associated with HIV. So LIP is associated with HIV and more common in children so less often seen in adults and in non-HIV uh, group. Then there's another rare entity described which is again evolved over the last uh, decade which is called Pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis. Now this has got a peculiar involvement of uh, the pleura of the apices. So you will have features of ILD and when you look at the imaging, the apices as if you know those days, uh, this post TB sequelae used to have this apical cap kind of fibrosis. So like that kind of pleural involvement it has. It can be associated with connective tissue diseases, certain drugs as well, but when it does not have a etiology it's called idiopathic pleuroparenchyma fibroelastosis. Now coming to the major ones, the major ones in the current 2013 classification have been further subclassified into the chronic fibrosing ones, the smoking related ones and the acute or subacute ones. The chronic fibrosing ones are the IPF and the idiopathic 
non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. So these two are the chronic fibrosing ones. So these have quite rapid progression of fibrosis, IPF being worse compared to idiopathic NSIP. Then you have the smoking related ones which is the respiratory bronchiolitis associated interstitial lung, di lung disease which is very subtle involvement with centrilobular nodules uh, which happens in smokers. You just have to ask them to stop smoking in six months the nodules disappear. So that is RBILD. Then you have desquamative interstitial pneumonitis again of very ground glassing purely inflammation, no fibrosis at all, exclusively related to smoking. Stopping smoking is most often the treatment. Sometimes we need to give steroids for quicker resolution if there is a, a lot of involvement and causing functional impairment. The acute or the subacute ones are the organizing pneumonia which doesn't have a etiology when it is called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and the acute interstitial pneumonitis, which is probably one of the earliest described ILD, which goes by a syndromic name as well. What is the name of AIP? It goes after two people who described it. Haman and Rich syndrome. Haman and Rich syndrome. Again, uh, when uh, 25 years when you learn, only these things come up, Haman Rich syndrome, CFA, all these things. But now all those have got buried, but uh, somewhere uh, for MCQs, those may be important. So once we got that classification in our mind, our focus is going to be on uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Now there was a <coughs> national ILD uh, registry which got published in 2017. This was led by a centre in Delhi and there were 17 centres across India. We were not part of it. Uh, and uh, interesting part of this study was they, every diagnosis uh, biopsy or non-biopsy or if it's radiology, radiological images were sent to one center in Washington and the center in Washington uh, confirmed the diagnosis. The MDT there confirmed the diagnosis and that is how that came through. But the problem was uh, it had a lot of referral bias, selection bias because it, it is based on each center what they decided to send to the central registry in uh, uh, Delhi. So, uh, as you see here, uh, then the other other big chunks, so that's about 1046 patients. Then there is a PGI Chandigarh uh, single center um, group came up with 803 patients. And there is a recent publication last month in PLOS One, where they've combined all this and published 3089 patients uh, and they've done some incidence prevalence assumptions. But the striking thing to know is, the blue is the ILD India registry and the green is the uh, PGI Chandigarh data. The ILD India registry found that hypersensitivity pneumonitis is the commonest DPLD, which was uh, not at all true in the PGI Chandigarh group, where actually sarcoidosis was the major one. And in their second series that come out, also sarcoidosis is the major one. So th this is what probably the referral bias, something that, that has caused that to happen is the thought. But our focus is here is there's about 15% uh, among all the DPLDs, around 15 to 17% is contributed by IPF. Next. So this is this study which is uh, recently published, which has uh, which has made some. So there is a tri city around Chandigarh where the referral has come. So they have taken the entire population of the tri city and made some assumptions based on possible referral rate to PGI Chandigarh, and they have calculated some incidence and prevalence. So among subtypes, 17 percent, but they went on to derive that the annual incidence and prevalence of ILD in India is about 10 to 20 per, 10 to 20 per 100,000 population incidence, and uh, about 50 to 100 is the, per 100,000 population is the prevalence. Then they also made absolute number crude, crude estimates. For example, IPF, these are all in thousands. 75 to 150,000 is the total number of IPF in India. So that's about, uh, and one more estimate shows another number. So we are looking at about uh, 10 lakh, I think. Uh, for 100,000, it's about 100. So 100,000, 100,000. Am I getting it right? So, 100. So, th no, no, this is the overall number. 
absolute number in thousands. So it's about hundred thousands. Hundred thousand is uh, ten lakh, right? Yeah. So ten lakh is the estimated number of IPF in India uh, by this uh, estimate. But uh, there is uh, no other data, epidemiological data from India. But uh, so I think this will stand uh, for a long time to be cited. Okay. Next. So to understand the profile of IPF, uh, the clinical profile is more to do with the recognition, but this is important when you approach the guideline and the algorithm. So the clinical profile of IPF is an elderly male. The usual uh, occurrence is in the sixth and the seventh decade, but like many of the non-communicable diseases, uh, the data that we have from India says that it happens about a decade earlier. So about the fifth, sixth, seventh decade, male smoker, because these are the risk factors, who has bibasal velcro crackles and clubbing, but it happens in only about 50% of IPF is the clinical profile you are looking at. Because this is a starting point. It, it is like your uh, pre-test probability. Because the entire algorithmic process of diagnosis of IPF depends on your pre-test probability. If you have a 40-year-old female with ILD, then it will not go into that basket at all. The approach will be different. Physiological profile, I have some PFT should show. But uh, what it shows is restriction with reduction in diffusion capacity and there is exercise desaturation and a new terminology which has evolved in the last decade is called distance saturation product. It's there in our walk test. So it is a product of the distance walked and the saturation that has happened because sometimes due to various reasons patient may walk less. If you look at only the distance walked or the saturation in isolation, it doesn't give you a correct estimate of the exercise desaturation. So distance saturation product exp expressed in me percentage gives a good uh, reflection and a good follow-up measure for ILDs. Radiological and pathological I will discuss uh, as part of the rest of the diagnosis. Next. So physiological profile, what do you think this is? Hmm? Sorry? Flow volume loop. Someone said that. I don't know who said that. Who said that? Yeah. So can you, can you, what do you make out of this flow volume loop? So there is a volume on the x-axis and flow on the y-axis during a spirometric. Yeah. So can you make any diagnosis out of that? Volume is? Volume is reduced. How did you make that out? X-axis or y-axis? Excellent. So, so this is the predicted. So for this patient's height and age, they should have blown so much vital capacity but the vital capacity is stunted here. And there is no obstruction because in obstruction, this cave will become concave. Here it is straight. So this is an exclusive restrictive loop. When you look at a spirometry, you should always look at the loop before looking at the numbers. The reason is you could have a central airway obstruction, upper airway obstruction, which is all showing up different numbers on PFT, but they are because of different etiology. Once you looked at the loop and you know you're dealing with a restrictive process, now we look at the numbers. Okay, who wants to go ahead with interpreting that? Quickly, quickly, any volunteer to interpret the PFT? You, you all you all come across pyrometry. Yeah, come from anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, batsman. Come. Tell us. What will you look at first? The first thing is loop. We finish the loop. Yeah, now. The, the functional vital capacity, FEC. And before looking at the FEC? FEV1 by FEC. FEV1 by FEV1 FE. by FEC. You have to look at the ratio. One click, please. That is what you have to look at. In ratio, don't look at percentage rate. You should look at the pre value. Because ratio is absolute. There is no percentage here. So that number you are looking at, FEV1 by FEC ratio, is that normal? Yeah, it's normal. What is normal? More than 80. More than? 80. Yeah, more than 80. But practical purposes, more than 70. Sir because uh, it is all derived from COPD studies that less than 70 is obstruction. The 80, as age goes up, ratio falls down. So in a 25-year-old, uh, 80 is normal, but in a 80-year-old, uh, 72 is also normal. So 70 is, you can be sure that below 70 is obstruction. Okay, you want to pass on? 
And then what do you look at next? So that's normal. So you can move to the next step to interpret your spinal metric. You look at the FEV1 and FEC separately. Yeah, it's more of the FE, FEC. You have a normal uh, FEC. FEV1 and FEC, so you're not worried about the FEV1. You're not looking at obstruction. You're looking at restriction. Next. You look at the FEC. Now, everything other than ratio, you look at the percentage predicted. Okay? Is that normal or abnormal? Yeah, abnormal. Abnormal yeah. because because uh, normal. low or high? It's uh, low. Low because what is the normal? Mm, and it should be around equal to the FPV one, so around eighty. Equal to the FPV one, your ratio is it's not about it's, it's not in relationship to FPV one at all. 80. Absolutely, everything other than ratio, which is seventy percent in PFT, BHU, everything, it's eighty percent. Anything below 80% is abnormal. So what is it here? It's below 80%. Below 80%. Yeah. So that tells you that there is? Restriction. Restriction. Here it is mild because mm -hmm. classification tells you that 60 to 80% is mild, 40 to 60 is moderate, less than 40 is severe. Okay? Right. You want to pass on to the next person? Okay. Yeah, what, do you, what do you want to look at next? So you know you are dealing with a mild restrictive process. But you need to further go on and characterize that it's true. Because restrictive restriction can be extra parenchymal or intra parenchymal. So what do you look at? DLCO. Yeah, you look at the DLCO and before DLCO you look at something else. No. Yeah, one click please. You look at the total lung capacity. Okay, that tells you that your uh, restriction is true. Okay. Yeah. And that again 80 percent to 68 is reduced. Reduce. Okay. In DLCO. Which value do we look at? So in DLCO you have, uh, so when we perform a DLCO we get this value, it's called the DLCO single breath. And then DLCO is dependent on the hemoglobin. So the patient's hemoglobin is entered here, and this is a this is here hemoglobin is above 14, so it doesn't change the uh, DLCO. Otherwise, if the hemoglobin was 9, uh, this would have been above 80 percent, because the drop in DLCO there is because of the hemoglobin. So this is a, a DLCO which is corrected for hemoglobin. Then the volume that is ventilated during the breath is also corrected for. That is what the VA stands for. It is a DLCO corrected for the alveolar volume ventilated. And this last value is corrected both for the ventilated volume and for the hemoglobin. Yeah, we'll move on. So predominantly that value is what you're looking for, corrected single breath value. So we are looking at a mild restrictive process on low FEC, low TLC, and impairment of diffusion capacity. Next. So when we go to the diagnosis of IPF, uh, so currently accepted worldwide gold standard for diagnosis is multidisciplinary team discussion. So every decision of uh, ILD needs to go through the MDD and that output is the, is the gold standard. So every histopathology, HRCT and all is now nowadays compared with the gold standard which is the MDT. So we look at the algorithm, we we'll look at the role of HRCT, we we'll look at the role of bronchoalveolar lavage, if at all, and we we'll look at the role of uh, histopathology. And uh, in, in today, as we stand today, a surgical lung biopsy is being replaced by cryotransbronchial lung biopsy, which has got almost equal yield and much better safety profile compared to surgical lung biopsy. Next. So just briefly, who are the members of an ILD MDT? There should be at least two pulmonologists with ILD special interest to ensure that if there are differences of opinion to come to a conclusion, there should be a thoracic radiologist. This is the bare minimum. If there is a lung biopsy specimen, then a pathologist with a pulmonary focus or ILD interest is required. When there are ambiguities in CTD, then a rheumatologist is preferable and then there are a whole list of miscellaneous people who may add to the value of a ILD MDT in terms of more in terms of planning treatment. Next. Now recently or 2020 I think 2019 there, were, there was a systematic review of 
uh, what is the value of a ILD MDT? So this was derived from 29 studies and the range of confirmed di diagnosis of ILD MDT was about 54 to 80 percent. A suggestion of diagnosis was 20 percent and unclassified ILD which went into the ILD MDT with additional information came out with a diagnosis in 71 percent. So this is the uh, uh, literature that we have to support ILD MDT. Next. So, <clears throat> this is what is overall suggested for evaluation of any ILD. You have a history, clinical examination, blood test, lung function test, HRCT. Then it goes to a MDT. Now the MDT decides this information is enough to make a diagnosis, diagnosis made. If the MDT decides, no, we need a ball, then it goes to doing a ball. Or it decides it needs a lung biopsy, either surgical or cryo, then it goes that way. And then it comes back to the MDT to put things together because none of these is 100% specific for the diagnosis. So it's multiple pieces of the puzzle that needs to be put together by the MDT to come to a diagnosis. Next. So this is from the ERS 2018 IPF gu guideline. There are two changes that have happened in this year's update which I will come to which is very important. Uh, however, this, this is the basic framework. So you have a patient, you have suspected IPF. Now this is where I said, you know, you have to have a 56 year old male with clubbing, bibasal crackles. I mean, not everything needs to be there, but the profile should be that way. You're not looking at a 35 year old uh, female with uh, clinical, uh, clinical and examination features wildly there. You will not put them through this algorithm. The workup for that is different. So you have a clinical picture that is fitting into IPF, then you look at potential causes of or association. For example, the confusing factors usually are uh, a 60 year old male with bibasal crackles could have rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD. I mean they could have had rheumatoid arthritis long back which we have not asked a proper history or it could be you know some of our UIPs we do RA anti CCP and they come elevated. They may have subclinical rheumatoid arthritis as well. So we need to look at causes. The next confusing feature is a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So you, you can, when chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis behaves pretty much like IPF, but the radiology will be different, but you will have again by basal crackles, clubbing, all that that's there. So it needs a focused antigen exposure history. The common ones are, you know, farmers, pigeon breeding, and very interestingly because this uh, ILD India registry had HP, uh, they actually published a sub-study looking at a risk factor long questioner and they found that in India the commonest cause of HP is not uh, pigeon or farmer. It is use of air coolers at home. Uh, so I, I believe in North India there is a lot of air coolers as opposed to AC and if you leave the air cooler after usage like that without properly maintaining you can have mold uh, that is comes in the air cooler, then you leave it for winter, then now mold is nicely formed and then in summer you start it again and you inhale mold. So it's an air cooler related hypersensitive pneumonitis. So in today, if you have a patient coming from North India who's got ILD, you have to have, you have to take history of air cooler. Like in our exams, if you don't ask, you're failed. Practical exam, it's, it's gained that much important. So, so you ask for history, you ask for history to look at causes of ILD before putting it in the IPF basket. Because if you have some tinge towards that, then your approach goes a bit different. You do a HRCT, you look at your, for example, HP, you look at HRCT fulfilling, which also looking like HP, then it goes out of the basket. It's not IPF. Now, if you're not getting any history like that, or even after doing your HRCT, it still looks like uh, IPF, then it comes back into looking at the HRCT pattern. Now again these patterns are based on your initial entry into the algorithm saying this has got a clinical picture of IPF, that's very important. Then you can determine is it IPF, which means earlier it was called definite IPF, you, sorry UIP on HRCT or is it probable UIP or is it indeterminate for UIP or is it alternate diagnosis. So four categories are the outcome of a HRCT and only UIP goes there, note that, that is going to change in the 2022 guideline. 
So only UIP goes there and all three category come here. So again, after UIP, it goes to the MDT, MDT agrees, it goes to IPF and this figure eight is a colorful chart which I'll go to uh, in a minute. Now, the rest of the three goes to the MDT and it needs more information to ascertain a diagnosis of IPF. So sometimes it is BAL. So what is the role of BAL will come to it in a minute, but what Baal tells us is if, if there is Baal neutrophilia, the process of IPF is a neutrophilic inflammation. So if you have, uh, say for example, probable UIP and you do a Baal and it shows neutrophilic inflammation, then putting the two together, you can come back to the MDT and say this is IPF. The reason that's important is a, a close differential even radiologically to IPF is chronic HP, which is a lymphocytic predominant inflammation. If the ball is showing lymphocytosis, then it will go out of IPF to become uh, HP. Or if, if the clinical suspicion of IPF is still high, you may go on to require a biopsy to see whether it is IPF or chronic HP. Uh, but for indeterminate alternate, you most often require a biopsy. And again, this surgical biopsy is now being replaced by the cryo TBLB. It comes back to the MDT and gets diagnosed. Next. So we will focus a bit on HRCT. So there are three cardinal features on HRCT which tell you that it is UIP. One is honeycombing. Two is there are reticular abnormalities. These are the interlobar septal thickening and fibrosis that we see, linear strands of fibrosis which are diffuse and seen. And then you have traction bronchiectasis. You know, we all know about bronchiectasis, but here, if you imagine one alveoli or alveolar duct sitting there, and there is fibrosis happening all around it. It is pulling it in different directions. So eventually the bronchiole gets dilated. So the, it's not a true bronchiectasis in the sense of the classical bronchiectasis we know. There is a traction because of the fibrotic process in the lung which gives the definitive appearance of bronchio, bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis if it happens at the bronchiole. So that is called traction bronchiectasis. If these three features are there, then you can say that it is, don't click, eh? don't click. Uh, then you can call that it is UIP. No, no, next, next. After that, don't click. I have a catch there. So, honeycombing is defined as cluster. So, you can't have one single row and call it honeycombing. There should be a cluster. Usually, it should be at least more than two stacks of thick-walled cystic spaces of similar diameter around 3 to 10 mm, maximum reaching to 25 mm. Okay? So, can someone identify which of this is... Where is the honeycombing here? You are next. You want to end? Yeah, are you able to see from there? Is there honeycombing? Where is the honeycombing? Or is there no honeycombing? Is there a pointer? Then you can... I don't think there's a pointer. Need some exercise, I think. I hope you won't feel bad at the end of it because I have a catch in this slide. Which is honeycomb? These are all similar. So these are this, this? Yeah. These are the normal pulmonary vasculature. Yeah. These these are the central bronchioles will be that, that much large. So, what is the definition of bronchial cases? The bronchiole should be larger than the adjacent pulmonary artery. That is the radiological definition, which means, see, we have, we have a bronchiole there, that's a pulmonary artery. This is smaller than that, isn't it? So, it's not bronchial case. Only if it is larger than the adjacent pulmonary artery, it is bronchial case. What do you think these are? I thought you would go and look here. Huh? Very good. So good. Next. So this is not this is not bronchiectasis because it is not thick walled. It is quite large, and these are not in the basis classically. So this is paraseptal emphysema. 
Now, sometimes you can have this coexisting with ILD, particularly with IPF. Anyone knows what, what it's called? Which, is, which actually changes your clinical picture. It confuses the clinical picture. When you have emphysema along with IPF, a weird thing happens. Emphysema elongates or increases lung capacity. And uh, IPF decreases lung capacity. So you can have a normal spirometry. FEC will be 80%. But the DLCO will be 20%. Because both of them affect the diffusion. One increases the lung volume, one decreases the lung volume. What is it called? It, even this can come as a short note. CPFE, you've heard of? Combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema. So that's an entity which is now well described. The commonest ILD is IPF. But it, it has been described now with other ILDs like fibrotic NSIP as well. Okay, next, let's move on. Right, so now we have four categories. It's okay if I overshoot the time a bit, sir. Uh, so, I, now you remember the four categories? We are going to go through those four categories. Anyone who wants, I mean, I don't want to embarrass you, but anyone wants to take a call on what this patient's CT profile looks like? And you have to put it into one of the baskets of indeterminate, alternate diagnosis, probable UIP, uh, definite UIP. Yeah, anyone wants it? It's only a guess, yeah. You can. You have to see what the findings are and say which category it belongs to. Okay, let me ask you some questions, focused. Is there honeycombing? Yeah? Right, so that's very clear. Okay, and the very, two, th two points to note. The honeycombing will be bi-basal, sub-plural, and kind of symmetrical. So can you see it's in the basis, apis, apices don't have any honeycombing. You have here thick-walled, almost equal size, around 3 to 10 mm stacks of more than 3 happening in the bi-basis and sub-plural. So this is classical honeycombing. One. What is the next one? Is there reticular abnormality? Is there reticular abnormality? Yes, no. Yes. So can you see this? These are the reticular abnormalities which are happening. This is the interlobar septal thickening, all that. So there are reticular abnormalities. Is there traction bronchiectasis? So these are the three points. Is there traction bronchiectasis? Not very apparent, uh, we could see that some dilatation here, not very clear. But overall it's fitting into that profile of IPF. So next, so this is UIP or definite UIP on a HRCT, okay, next. This is another patient, all having the same clinical features. So is there honeycombing? Yes, no, yes. Like, yeah, there are, there are, there is subplural, there is bibasal, but can you see, are there more than two stacks? No. There's only one single layered cystic appearance here. It's not like the one we saw previously. So this does not have honeycombing, but it has a classical, can you see, all dilated bronchi with fibrosis around. So this is classically traction bronchiectasis. So traction bronchiectasis is there, Reticular abnormalities are there, but there is no honeycombing. This is the classical picture where it will be. What is the next category? Probable UIP. If only if there is honeycombing, you can call it UIP. Yeah, next. So this is called probable UIP. Next. Is there honeycombing? No. Is there traction bronchiectasis? No, very good. Is, is there, are there reticular abnormalities? Yes, very good. You are, you are all becoming good in HRCT. So there are all these reticular abnormalities. There is bi-basal predominance. You know, we are moving far, further away from classical UIP. So this is called indeterminate for UIP. Next.
Right. What do you see here? Is there honeycombing? Yes? Yeah, kind of. They are all really not, yeah, you could call it honeycombing. Is that traction bronchiectasis? Can't be really sure, but there's some bronchiolectasis. Bronchiolectasis is there. See, bronchiectasis will happen little centrally. Here, only here it is dilated. These are bronchiolectasis. That doesn't classify as uh, uh, UIP feature. Okay, then, um, can, can you see that there is a lot of haziness? Okay, there's a lot of ground glassy. So, these are features which are not consistent with UIP. So, if there is ground glassing, and the other thing you see is these bronchiolectators and all are becoming central. They are not uh, the subplural predominant involvement. So, this is another pattern of, and you have ground glassing, another pattern of indeterminate for UIP. Okay, next. Hmm, what do you see here? Is there honeycombing? Yes or no? No, come on, by now you are getting confident. No, honeycombing. Are there reticular abnormalities? Yes, very good. There are a lot of reticular abnormalities. Uh, is there traction bronchi bronchiectasis? You are saying no, but uh, look at these. These are all larger than these vessels. So there is some amount of traction bronchiectasis that is there. This is central, this is not bronchiole. So there is traction bronchiectasis. But is there a lot of ground glassing? Yes. So you know this is not UIP, it's not probable UIP. Indeterminate, you can say, if you know this is not fitting into anything. But what is one striking feature in this? That's quite different from all the previous CTs. Yeah, yeah? Anything that's striking? Mismatch, what do you say? M5 C matter changes, okay. So this is not M5 CMA. M5 CMA will have uh, you will have a thin wall and no no pulmonary vasculature inside or almost thinned out. Whereas here, can you see you can see vasculature inside. These are classical areas of sparing of the secondary lobule which you see in air trapping. So, this is, can you see, here and there, and, and emphysema will be, follow a pattern. Here, patchy areas of non-involvement of secondary lob lobule. This is a classical picture of air trapping. So, if you have air trapping, some traction bronchiectasis, bronchiolectasis, reticular abnormalities, what disease does it fit into? No, RBILD. If you see, there are only few spots here and there. That is RBILD. It's a very subtle disease, completely reversible. Which other ILD has airway involvement? Predominantly, it has got airway involvement. Yeah? Yeah, I think you're right. Hypersensitive monitors, excellent. So this is a classical picture, HRCT picture of hypersensitive monitors. Next, so this is text. An alternate diagnosis HRCT has, okay? And if you look at from MCQ point of view, radiologists you want to use a lot of names. So this is called the H E sign. If you cut a meat, uh, like pork, if you cut, you'll have bone and some, uh, in the cross section, you'll have some fat and muscle and all that. It has that kind of appearance. So this is called H E appearance of HRCT, uh, quite specific for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Next. Okay, just quickly, three different patterns, different patients, what, which, what would you call that? These are uh, sagittal cuts, you know you have some honeycombing, so that will probably go into UIP, this has got traction bronchio, bronchiectasis but no honeycombing, so this will go into probable UIP. Uh, this has got some reticular abnormality, no traction bronchiectasis, no honeycombing. It will go for indeterminate for UIP. Okay, next. Now the roll of ball. 
ball is neutrophil predominant so a neutrophil lymphocytic ratio uh, is can help in the diagnosis of ipf and this is particularly not patients with ipf may not be fit for a biopsy then this is what you can do sometimes they're not even fit for a ball then we have to stick only with the clinical radiological information and may make a ild mdt diagnosis uh, so more the neutrophil predominance, the more active disease, more progression. So there's some prognostic information that you can get. If you treat someone and repeat a ball, you can have decrease. Uh, it's very useful in differentiation with chronic HP. Has a small role in the diagnostic algorithm. Next. Now this is the 2022 update, which has got two changes. See, can you see the probable UIP is moved here. This is because they've reviewed studies of over 10 years and looked at, so everyone with probable UIP went out with biopsy earlier. And about 85% of them landed up having an eventual diagnosis of IPF. So the current recommendation has moved. If you have a clinical picture that's fitting into UIP and you have IPF and you have probable UIP, then you again don't need a biopsy. The MDD can agree on a diagnosis of IPF. The second change is cryobiopsy. So just briefly to say cryobiopsy is done under total intravenous anesthesia, sometimes under GA, it can be done under deep, deep sedation like propofol as well. Uh, it, it, it has a cryoprobe which freezes the tip of the probe to minus 60 degrees centigrade, bronchoscopically placed in an area where you think CT abnormality is there and it's frozen for about seven seconds and on freeze, we remove the bronchoscope uh, because, and you have to keep going in and coming in. So you have a conduit, you need to have a conduit like an LMA or intubation uh, and you get chunks of tissue, which is like uh, uh, one centimeter, two centimeter like that. There is a huge risk of bleeding and the death happens because of bleeding. So they did a modification. They put a Fogarty catheter inside. As soon as the biopsy is taken, the balloon is inflated. So that bleeding is contained inside there. With that, the risk of bleeding and bleeding related complications have come down drastically. The second complication is pneumothorax. But if it is done fluoroscopy guided, knowing that you're well away from the pleura, the chances of pneumothorax become lesser. So this is coming up as an important modality and is almost, so the yield difference between surgical lung biopsy and cryobiopsy is about 10%. If cry, surgical lung biopsy can give 85 to 90% diagnosis, cryo TBLB can give about 75 to 80% diagnosis. So years from now, surgical lung biopsy for uh, ILD will, will not happen and more will go towards the cryobiopsy. All right, next. This is histopathology. Now this also has UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate for UIP and alternate diagnosis. But I don't know it well enough like the HRCT, so I cannot teach you that. This is supposed to be all those patterns. A pathologist knows, uh, I do not know. Next. But what do we know when we sit in the MDT is, you have four histologic pattern, you have four HRCT pattern. Putting this together in the clinical scenario enables you to give certainty to your diagnosis of IPF. Is it definitely IPF? Is it likely indeterminate or is it something else? So this is an important table when you're trying to put the two together. Next. Now prognosis or what happens to IPF over a long time? I said the five-year five survival is about 50%, median survival time but not everyone behaves the same. There are some rapid progressors like patient A who dies in one year despite diagnosis. There are patients who have acute exacerbations and worsening and then have a plateau period, then rapidly descend. There are little more slow progressors and even slower progressors. And there is a subclinical period, then there's a clinical period and often there is a lag time about six months to one year before ILD is diagnosed. It's been treated with ATT, treated with various things before a definite diagnosis is made. Next. So this is a recent systematic review and they looked at how this came about. See, there are a lot of IPF trials. Until today, 
we could have done an IPF trial with placebo. From now onwards, we can't do because there is definite antifibrotic. So they took all the IPF trials and analyzed the placebo group because they, that will be the natural progression of the disease. And they found that, so the, I have rounded off, there's a lot of range given in this study. One to two years mortality is 10 percent, two to five years, 40 percent, more than five years mortality is 70 percent. Uh, but this varies from patient to patient whether they are A or B or C or D. Okay, next. Now, when you are trying to predict prognosis, this is a well-validated index. It's got very three very simple uh, principle. It's not getting along with people like Dr. Dilip Mathai's statement, gap. Uh, so this is gender, activity, and uh, physiology. Sorry, gender, age, and physiology. Male gender has got worse prognosis. Higher the age versus the prognosis, versus the lung function versus the prognosis. Based on this, you'll get a 0 to 8 score. And there is mortality prediction based on this score as to how long this particular patient is going to live. Next. Treatment. I'm not going to go into details on the studies of uh, what it is. The current accepted treatment is antifibrotics. Uh, the most... Uh, Two FDA-approved antifibrotics are ninditinib and pyrifenidone. Ninditinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which has got multifaceted action in the progression of IPF. Uh, but to remember that all these do not arrest fibrosis. They only slow the decline in FEC. But that is good enough to prolong the life of patients with IPF. So the main side effect of ninditinib is 30% of them have diarrhea. So the dose is 150 milligram BD. Uh, if they have diarrhea and not tolerating it well, you can decrease it to 100 milligram BD. Uh, the cost is about 4,500 per month. Uh, it's become the popular drug now because only twice a day. Till six, uh, about six months back, it cost 40,000 a month. So it was not affordable, but now that is the preferred antifibrotic. Perifenidone was the preferred uh, antifibrotic before Ninditin price came down. It again costs about 4,500 per day, but there's a huge pill burden. It comes in 200 ta milligram tablet and the dose is three tablets three times a day. So nine tablets a day and it has main side effect is got photosensitivity. So you have to prescribe uh, uh, sunscreen whenever patient goes out in uh, on light exposed areas. Uh, but because of the so many pills uh, patient has to take, uh, hardly anyone prescribes perifenidone nowadays. So now the company is coming up with 400 milligram and 600 milligram tablets to make it competitive to Ninitanin. Rehabilitation is very important uh, because what capacity is there, maximizing that. Vaccination, oxygen when required, lung transplantation, but about the 50 years, uh, 5 years survival post transplantation is around 50%. Uh, and and uh, in most centers in India which are doing transplant, they won't uh, operate on anyone who's above 60 years old. So it's not very favorable for IPF in India. Palliative care has got a very important role. M many of our patients who go down that route, uh, you are lost to what to give. But when you initiate some morphine on OPD basis, they tolerate their breathlessness much better and have a better quality of life. So morphine, anxiolitis, some of them have dryness of mouth. So symptomatic palliative approach is becoming a crucial aspect of management of IPF. Next. Just to show, I've just taken from in, Impulses 1 and 2 trials, which are the two main tri trials published in NEJM on Ninditanib. What it does is, you know, that, that is a change in FEC. See, the, this is the, uh, the Ninditanib group, which had 114 ml drop in the FEC. The placebo group had 240 ml drop in FEC over one year's time. So it, it slows the decline. Not that Ninditanib will not decline, but the decline will be much lesser compared to... What is the normal FEC decline in normal people? Do your FEC decline? Yes? Aging, lung aging. So after the age of 24, 25, everyone's FEC drops by 30 ml per year. So, so if you look at that, that's about, the difference is about 100, and 100 ml, 120 ml like that. So that's quite significant compared to your normal decline. Okay, next. How frequently do you need to monitor? Uh, initially three monthly and then uh, six monthly. What all do you do? Spiro, 
lung volume DLCO where the patient is able to do and walk test. Yearly HRCT is mandated because IPF has a higher risk of developing lung cancer. So if we do yearly HRCTs, we could diagnose lung cancer early. So that's been recommended. And whenever there is a clinical physiological disagreement. Next. Complications or comorbidities, patients can go into respiratory failure, uh, uh, typically type 1, uh, and they require home oxygen. But when they are in end stage, they can go into type 2 when a lot of lung is uh, not enough for even carbon dioxide diffusion, which is much higher. You know how many times carbon dioxide is more diffusible than oxygen according, uh, uh, across the alveolar membrane. So it's about 20 times. Carbon dioxide is 20 times more diffusible. That's why in diffuse parenchymal lung disease, you don't go into, or many of the causes of type 1 respiratory failure, they don't go into type 2 respiratory failure because uh, carbon dioxide can diffuse much faster. But when more lung is involved, they can go into type 2 as well. Pulmonary hypertension is uh, when there is a lot of lung involvement or persistent hy hy hypoxia, it can cause pulmonary hypertension. There is no uh, pulmonary hypertension specific drug that is useful in uh, IPF related hypertension. CPFE is something we already discussed. They are at increased risk of pneumothorax, secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, and they have very less capacity to tolerate that. Very quick, quick ICD and subsequent pleurodesis is required. Lung malignancy is more. They are at increased risk of pulmonary embolism because of their age. They are, have a lot of cardiovascular comorbidities. Acute exacerbation of IPF, I'll just deal with in a slide later. Yeah. So it's important to differentiate acute exacerbation versus disease progression. So the classical cutoff is four weeks. If someone is progressing over more than four weeks, it is progression. If progression is less than four weeks, it is and other causes are ruled out, it is an acute exacerbation. Acute exacerbation in IPF also is an inflammatory process. So they respond to steroids. Uh, they, they benefit with NIV to help with the work of breathing. Antibiotics if infection is suspected clinically, but we strongly discourage putting them on ventilator because in IPF, the mortality on invasive ventilation is close to 100%. So there's no point really putting them through ventilation. Next. Last couple of slides on progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So these are a group of diseases which can be fibrotic NSIP can be hypersensitivity pneumonitis, can be CTD, ILD, but which progress over time. And this is the first time criteria have been laid down to define that progression. Next slide. This is a slide with the same classification of ILD. They have tried based on available literature. This blue area is the proportion of these ILDs who are likely to become progressive over time. So, it is based on very sparse data. Next. So, this is the current uh, criteria which is released only a couple of months back, uh, which, which tells us that you should have two, two of these three should be fulfilled. This is non-IPF ILD. Huh? Oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you that. For IPF, there is definition of progression. IPF definition of progression is more than 10% drop in FEC or more than 15% drop in DLCO with worsening clinical and radiological. Whereas here it is different. Here and again in PFT there can be relative decline and absolute decline. IPF studies have all used relative decline. What do I mean by relative is current FEC in liters minus three months back FEC divided by the previous FEC into 100. That will give you, that is called a relative change in the FEC. Whereas here it's absolute. This means someone's uh, FEC was 65% predicted. Now it became 59% predicted. That is 6% absolute drop in FEC. Within one year, if there's a, that much drop, a similarly a 10% drop in DLCO. Again, not relative like for IPF. IPF, you have to do current minus previous by previous into 100. This is absolute reduction over one year with certain radiological changes which have been described with progression can fit into progressive pulmonary fibrosis or previously called progressive fibrotic ILD. Now, this is non-IPF. The importance of this is once they fit in this criteria, 
they become eligible for antifibrotic. Now these are based on studies in CTD like uh, census 1, census 2 and all these trials only in inditinib has been used and there is study on entire non-IPF spectrum and again they found that inditinib slows the decline of F FVC in addition to suppose the patient is on prednisolone and mycophenolate. In addition to that if you add antifibrotic they have slower FEC decline if they fulfill this criteria. So this is again important to know that they may have a role in uh, slowing the decline of fibrosis in these patients. Next. My last slide. Uh, looking at future, I mean IPF is reasonably established but the entire classification is still evolving. Uh, there's a lot of work going on on diagnosis and prognosis. NVCR is a genomic classifier. Uh, currently FDA approved, it, it codes for 193 genes. So you take a patient suspected to have IPF and you run through those 193 genes based on the number of genes that come positive. It, in, it has about 85% confidence of making a diagnosis of uh, IPF. But extremely expensive and not yet come into India. A lot of biomarkers. Uh, which are uh, ball biomarkers, blood biomarkers and recent interest is in breathomics which is breath biomarkers. Nitric oxide is an excellent biomarker uh, and there is a lot of metabolomic work, proteomic, transcriptomic work going on. AI, AI is now coming into diagnosis and severity of HRCT scan. You send a HRCT scan through the AI, it can quantify fibrosis and tell you scores on prognosis and similarly on diagnosis. And uh, there is a new concept of uh, E-NOS, that is you go breathe into that, it can tell you IPF with so much confidence. That is based on multiple volatile biomarkers where it forms, uh, so they, ha they have taken IPF confirmed, HP confirmed, CDD confirmed, blow and uh, the, there is machine learning that happens and then you take a mix of thing blinded for the machine and it can tell you IPF based on the breath. So these are all uh, for the future. Follow up, there is a lot of biomarkers coming up and there are a lot of new drugs and repurposed drugs that are, which are being studied as well. So to conclude, ILD is a complex disease. IPF is a prototype of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. It is quite rapidly progressive but each patient can have a different course. Antifibrotics are the only current uh, approved drugs which can slow the decline of FEC but there's a whole lot of non-pharmacological treatment including palliative care that is important and there is the group of non-IPF ILDs which could have a progressive phenotype if recognized early could be eligible candidates for antifibrotics as well. Thank you and I can, I'm happy to take questions. Anybody has any questions you'd like to ask? Uh, so, there's no role right now for... Nobody gives a uh, mycophenolate, uh, rituximab, any of those treatments have been tried for regular ILD like that? Any of the immunosuppressants have been tried or those are... Not, there's only antifibrotic at the current IPF. moment. For IPF, yes. No, I'm, I'm talking for IPF. So, currently there's no role for that. Okay. Okay, guys, let's give sir one more hand and the, our, our, our next talk is on. The next one is, we have not planned the next one yet. Okay, so we are, sure, so this is just the first of three talks. As you can see, there are different types of IPF, so the PGs and faculty should come and attend. It's a lot of learning value and you can see Bani's passion in teaching us, so I mean, that is all new to most of us, so please come and attend the next session. So. Bunny, join us for breakfast and then you can go. Thank you all. We'll uh, sing grace and then we'll have breakfast.